I have decided to take a little time off from writing esoteric essays on medium in order to try my hand at the video essay. Some say I have an adequate voice, if a bit quiet, I'll let you be the judge of that. Either way, I intend for this essay to be informative and entertaining, or failing both, at least a little thought-provoking. A few minds on YouTube that I largely respect, many more that I do not respect, have broken into a debate over whether or not there is an objective criteria for art criticism. I'll link a few videos from those aforementioned minds in the description below, but needless to say, I find this conversation fascinating. As a creator that makes somewhat heady and metaphorical art, you can see that I have some skin in the game with regards to how we assess art. This essay, then, is not a response to any particular video, nor would I be particularly interested in a response to this video from someone in the objective school. I'm attempting to make a holistic critique of this vein of thought, yes, but I'm also attempting to use this discussion as a springboard towards more interesting discussions of art. That said, I think there's been enough preamble to establish my intentions. Part 1. What is art? Or, simply, why should I care? It's impossible to say when art truly began. Whether our ancestors started painting by the fire life or crafting decorative artifacts. But we can say that there have been theories of art ever since there have been theories at all. There have been... Also, numerous debates over what counts as legitimate art, but we'll get to those later. Much of what we understand about ancient cultures comes from the remains of art they produced, coalescing to a greater idea of what these people believed and how they conducted themselves in life. For example, the Code of Hammurabi is not just an important legal text of Mesopotamia, it is also a work of art. Throughout the city-state, people could observe the Code and its general philosophy of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Yet even if you could not read the words, you could understand the authority bestowed upon them by the relief at the top. We see the king Hammurabi standing before the god Anu, whom would usually tower above any man. Yet here he sits on an elevated chair and can see eye to eye with the king. While this image is not part of the literal text, it is a necessary part of the text overall because the relief establishes that Anu imparted these laws onto Hammurabi, and as such, this establishes the religious ethos meant to undergird its legal legitimacy. Though theological, the Code of Hammurabi is an example of legal philosophy long before the supposed birthplace of philosophy in the Greek Isles. Scholars attribute the first scientific inquiry and system of metaphysics to Thales as he studied the phenomena of eclipses without resorting to an explanation via the will of the gods. The Greeks defined science as natural philosophy. This exemplified an oppositional relationship between the study of the natural world against spiritualism. However, before the age of philosophy in Athens, Greek poets and playwrights dealt with philosophical themes through the dialectic of heroes and gods. Notably, the Oedipal trilogy of tragic plays written by Sophocles details the generational disillusion of a family with a palpable absence of the gods in any physical manifestation. In Antigone, the central conflict between the titular character and the king Creon is in their interpretation of the gods' will, as the former is set to perform a traditional burial in respect of her family, while the latter insists upon his sovereignty as a king ordained by the gods. There is no more deadly peril than disobedience. States are devoured by it, homes laid in ruins, armies defeated, victory turned to rout, while simple obedience saves the lives of hundreds of honest folk. Throughout the Oedipal Trilogy, there is a motif of blindness, and though Oedipus res removes his own eyes, Creon is blinded by his own hubris. The topic of hubris is also quite prominent in Plato's Socratic Dialogues, as Socrates informs his interlocutors that they cannot learn anything until they are willing to admit their own ignorance. In these dialogues, Plato will present a prominent Athenian figure debating Socrates, and Socrates will poke holes in their assumptions about concepts like education, truth, or morality. It's an important lesson that philosophy teaches us, that we should never simply trust something for being common sense. This will become an even more important lesson in tackling the objective school. 
Both the Coat of Hammurabi and Antigone are examples of art that have had immense effect on modern law and philosophy, respectively. Though two different art forms, what they share is instructive as to a broad definition of art. Now this lists out some general qualities that we can agree upon. 1. A piece of art relies upon human subjectivity. The Coat of Hammurabi asserts a specific vision of justice that the state imposes on its people. It also requires a declaration of legitimacy in the eyes of those peoples. The piece itself is a subjective interpretation of an abstract idea like justice, yet it conceals the subjectivity behind the ethos of Mesopotamian culture. Antigone also addresses different subjective views, yet it allows greater room for interpretation within its audience. There is still the ethos of the gods, yes, but it is not imminent in the text, but rather in its subtext. The play does land on one side of the debate, that being the side of Antigone, but it also has an ambiguity to it that allows the audience to decide for themselves to what extent Creon was truly deluded. A piece of art can be distinguished from its environment. Its quality is a bit more complex, though it seems at first quite simple. As an illustration, one might say that the Mona Lisa is a piece of art that is separate from the Louvre. However, the Louvre is itself a piece of architectural art. So for the purposes of analysis, we must establish that the Louvre is a non-factor in judging the Mona Lisa. Day-to-day -day language performs a separation implicitly, but you can still certainly make the case that the history of the Louvre and the Mona Lisa inherently change the context of both. Zooming in further, though, one might say that the Mona Lisa is a piece of art that is separate from the frame that surrounds it. The frame is art, the craftsmen spend much of their creative effort on it, but it's not what the vast majority of attendants are coming to see. It is thus necessary for us to differentiate what is text from what is metatext, even if this distinction can become somewhat arbitrary in certain instances. There is an audience present that acknowledges a piece of art as a piece of art. You can say that a painting or film objectively exists even if there is no one who has ever seen it. But can we say that this is a piece of art? From the opposite direction, cannot someone proclaim a simple rock found on the ground as a piece of art? This is the first real problem that comes about regards to objective art criticism. Because the quality of art is not a property that is imminent within the object itself, you could argue that this quality does exist, but at this point you would be arguing for metaphysics, and we would no longer be in the realm of verifiable knowledge anymore. I'll touch on this topic again later on, but let's say for now that if at least one observer acknowledges something as a piece of art, and that thing is a piece of art even if they are no longer directly observing it. This criterion is my own, and I do not claim that this definition of art is an objective one, but for the purposes of my argument I must ask that you accept it for the duration of this essay. I've intentionally made the definition so broad in order to eliminate as much of my bias as possible, but as human beings with a subjective experience, I can never be fully objective in any endeavor. However, I should point out that if you can identify such a broad definition as unobjective, then it seems disingenuous to me that you would identify much more specific definitions as objective. Over the course of human history, there have been new forms of art that people have always decried as illegitimate for any number of reasons. Plato wished for all poets to be cast away from his republic because he saw them as inherently sowing discontent into the demos. Many scoffed at books as being low art, especially around the period of Gutenberg's printing press, since it became common entertainment for all people who could learn English. Both films and video games have been written off as pointless fads, and they are now staples of media consumption throughout the world. Understanding all of this, I think it's best to be skeptical of those who would tailor art along very particular dimensions. Part 2. Okay, what is objective art criticism then? As I stated before, objective art criticism already runs headlong into a wall when you consider that art depends on the subjectivity of those who view it. In order to move through most of the arguments presented by objective art criticism, I will create a theoretical critic named Steve, and Steve will begin by addressing this topic. I understand that this opens me up to the criticism of using a straw man. I'm fine with that, because I have seen this sort of dialogue that occurs when you single out any of the actual critics. All that said, let's see what Steve thinks. You say that art is essentially subjective. Doesn't that imply that subjectivity is an objective quality of art? Well, Steve, I think this is an important question to consider, 
but it's also one beyond the scope of art criticism as a field. When I say that art is essentially subjective, I'm not saying that it is objectively subjective, but that art can't exist. Art is one of the most important things in my life. It really isn't a thing in any material sense. Art is an idea that is necessary for the purposes of language as a means to demarcate one thing from another, but it has no more of a solid character than the self or God. All these ideas could have objective existence in a theoretical sense, there's no empirical means by which to establish the existence of any idea in the material world. If I'm not making much sense, I apologize. I think it would be helpful to reference someone much smarter than I, that being the literary critic Kenneth Burke. Let us conceive of an ideal paradigm contrasting two kinds of behavior. There's some material operation to perform, such as the planting, cultivating, and harvesting of crops, or the tracking down of an animal and the distribution of the spoils after it has been slain. These material operations would be, in the strictest sense, a doing. In the course of any such tribal performance, the various amounts of saying would be involved. Since the resources of speech can guide a cooperative enterprise, as a member of so a football team can go into a huddle consult before a play. But over and above such strict pragmatic use of speech, as a set of instructions, exhortations, ammonitions directly related to the material operations in connection with which these resources are utilized, there is a further possibility, and here enters the other contrasting sign of our ideal paradigm. Here enters, in brief, a figure that I would call the Myth Man. As regards a ball game, the difference between the use of symbols and guiding a material operation and the Myth Man's use of symbols would correspond to the difference between the teams in a huddle consulting about the next play and the kind of pageantry we often watch, where bands and pretty girls and etc. in uniform maneuver about the field, perhaps even contriving by various deployments to spell names or initials that are relevant to the occasion. Burke's myth man is the man that deals in language, the man that deals in ideas. While pragmatic symbols are meant to coordinate man as he exists in the material world, Burke applies this paradigm to a football game, but we could just as easily apply it to the world of science. Chemists and physicists examine the material world and thus record it in a pragmatic language in order to communicate their observations with each other. While the Myth Man takes these findings and writes about them in news segments and pop science magazines. We must remember, though, Burke specifies that his paradigm is ideal. We do not live in an ideal world. Therefore, just as pragmatic language informs the language of a Myth Man, the language of the Myth Man also informs the language of the pragmatic. This means that, even if you were to judge a piece of representative art on how well it resembles its subject, you could still not claim that your judgment is objective. Even if we can't really critique art objectively, shouldn't we at least try to be as close to objectivity as possible? If everyone agrees that something is a criteria for good art, can we treat that as pr practically objective, whether or not it is literally objective? Well, I agree with this sentiment in a vacuum that we should do the best we can to make our critiques rigorous, we do not live in a vacuum. Contradictory as it may seem, objectivity is just as much an idea as art, and your definition of objectivity is the product of the society in which it is formed. The methodology that is most popular for people like Steve, at least from my observation, is positivism. Positivism is most popular in the hard sciences, has less prominence in the social sciences, and is pretty marginal in the liberal arts. Is ideology that denies the fact that it is an ideology, because its practitioners attempt to reach empirical truth through consensus and a scientific method. When positivists do apply their process to art criticism, they will attempt to focus exclusively on the text itself using criteria that most people would consider important for creating good art. There are three ways that a positivist goes about establishing a consensus for certain ideas. A significant number of people who you poll indicate that an idea is important, number of significant individuals indicate that an idea is important. One or more experts in the field indicate that an idea is important. Regarding the first method, it's important to realize that just because the majority of people value something does not mean that this thing really has greater value. This sort of thinking is based around what someone might call the marketplace of ideas, where the value of thought is measured along the lines of supply and demand. However, if we follow this method, 
We would say that an indigenous perspective is not important because indigenous people only make up a relatively small percentage of the American population. I wonder why. The second method is equally problematic in this regard because people that we regard as significant tend to be rich, white, and male. The last method could potentially be more open to minority voices. The issue is that positivists would likely privilege positivist experts and this creates a clear tautology. Positivism tries to eliminate bias, but in the case of art criticism, it only disguises the bias a positivist already holds. When a positivist tries to analyze the art of a native person or an LGBTQ plus person, they would more than likely miss the intricacies of the subtext. Most positivists do not take concepts such as imperialism or heteronormativity seriously, so they would be unable to examine experiences of oppression outside of shallow acknowledgement of explicit illustrations in the text. Moreover, minority groups have their own cultural norms, and a critic must educate herself on these cultures, or we would never see critique of art from other cultures at all. Well, if there's no objective means to evaluate whether art is good or bad, why should we even bother? I'm glad you asked that, Steve. Because I think this question is what will springboard us towards more interesting discussions of art in general. In practical sense, normal people have limited time and money. So a review that quantifies how entertaining a piece of art is allows them to more easily decide what to consume. On the contrary, though, I think trying to quantify a qualitative assessment necessarily creates an arbitrary, if not just plain confusing, metric. We see in the industry of games journalism that most reviews from major sites tend to skew in a range of 7 to 9 out of 10, because these publications are beholden to two gigantic companies that may restrict access if reviews are too unfavorable. Even when critics are not caught up in a conflict of interest, a tiered system is not equipped to deal with creators that ignore or, or intentionally disregard the conventions of popular media. Other reviewers will have a simple thumbs up or thumbs down system of binary recommendation, but this will limit a nuanced understanding of art. The cult following of So Bad It's Good films attests to the fact that no one piece of art fits every audience. In order to replace this outmoded form of criticism, then, I want to introduce you to something new, something magical, something filled with infinite possibilities, something called Part 3 Critical Theory. Okay, welcome all you amateur critical theorists to my crash course on learning and applying critical theory. Once again, I have no accreditation, and I am in no way saying that my views are gospel, but the ability to acknowledge this is part of the beauty of critical theory. The first thing to understand, then, is that there is no single theoretical lens that is critical theory. Instead, there are numerous lenses. Some critics will focus on one lens and view a series of works in a historical and philosophical context, while other critics will use many lenses in order to unpack a single work from numerous perspectives. The general purpose is to gain a more complete vision of either a certain epoch, art movement, or singular artwork by understanding it from disparate and even conflicting perspectives. If you want to see critical theory in action, I suggest checking out Lindsay Ellis's channel, especially her series, The Whole Plate. Now, I should specify that I do not think critical theory on its own is all you can or should use for criticism, but I think it works much better as a robust framework than objective art criticism. You can still review formal elements while paying attention to the interplay of text, subtext, and metatext, along with recognizing where form lends with these factors. Many people are at first apprehensive of critical theory when they hear of its origins, that being Marxists like Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer of the Frankfurt School. But I would hope that we are all above the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories people use to peddle anti-intellectualism. The truth is that the thinkers of the Frankfurt School weren't even the first criti critics to use critical theory. Not really. But they were the ones who first coined the term and extrapolated it for academic purposes. Plenty of normal people use critical theory all the time, especially marginalized people, because they have an understanding of history and can intuitively understand problematic narratives. I mean, do you really need a degree in film studies to say that Birth of a Nation is a racist film? The importance of critical theory as an academic field, though, lies in codifying these different narratives as you can confront them in totality. 
Much of philosophy, and long before Frankfurt was even a place, depends on observing themes in art and reflecting on their applicability to reality. You might have already noticed, but my descriptions of the Code of Hammurabi and Antigone already contain critical theory, namely analyzing them both within their larger historical context. If you were comfortable with that, then I hope you don't mind me expounding on some lenses that I have more familiarity with. Marxist theory. This is the lens most prominent in Horkheimer and Adorno's work, especially their book Dialectic of Enlightenment. The most simplistic form of Marxist theory, often to the point of parody, is identifying the conflict in a piece of literature as emblematic of class tensions. However, while this is a fair starting point, Marxist literary analysis tends to move on to further philosophical concepts proposed by socialist thinkers. For example, one could look at The Lord of the Rings as an illustration of anxieties about industrialization and a general desire to return to the soil. Agricultural communities are unable to emphasize with the industrial workers, represented as the orcs, nor can they build solidarity with each other thanks to prejudice. Therefore, their alienation leaves them susceptible to fascism, symbolized by the One Ring as an, as an analogy for the commodity. The further one fetishizes the ring, the further one becomes destructive to themselves and those around them. Postmodern Theory Postmodernism is a lens almost as controversial as Marxism, including within its practitioners. Olin Barthes popularized the term postmodern, but theorists like Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault were also lumped into it, despite their protestation. Each specific theory is different, but the most general description of postmodernism would be analysis that questions the most basic conventions of art. One of the most famous ideas proposed by a postmodernist is death of the author theoretical tool that acts as if the author of a work does not exist. This is not the only means of practicing postmodernist analysis, though. Another popular methodology of postmodernism is deconstruction. Deconstruction entails confronting a genre or movement on its own terms, ascertaining whether or not these works of art actually achieve the goals they supposedly promote. An example of a piece that deconstructs its own genre is Alan Moore's Watchmen which criticizes superhero comics by suggesting what superheroes would be like if they existed in a real world and not in comic books. Taking the specific logic of a genre and turning it back onto itself is one of the most effective means for deconstruction. Queer theory. Queer theory is one of the newest lenses in critical theory. Much of its methodology draws from feminist analysis. Queer theorists will examine how characters are coded within a piece of art, as well as their explicit or implicit sexual orientation. Perhaps the most prominent figure in queer studies, Judith Butler provides a framework for understanding a performative theory of gender in her book Gender Trouble. Just as there exists no objective quality of art, there is no objective quality of gender, yet both are inseparable from our sense of identity as human beings. We learn to perform according to gendered scripts taught to us through socialization, and as we perform, we define our identity. Gender performance is linked to sexual orientation, not because gender determines sexuality, but because patriarchy depends on heteronormativity. It's no wonder, then, that vampires are so often coded as gay, preventing a sort of forbidden alternative to pious heterosexual life. If you'd like to read an entire article where I apply queer theory to the genre of horror, I'll post a link to that in the description. I've not provided anywhere near enough lenses of critical theory for a complete understanding, but I hope the taste I have given inspires you to look further. Besides my sources, I will include links in the description for other videos that I think do a good job addressing this topic. Overall, I think it's, it's clear that, at the very least, objective art criticism leaves much less room for expansive discussions than critical theory. Art is central to the human experience, so we must be open to understanding all of its forms and functions if we are to see its full potential. Thank you.